so yeah, so today I'll tell you about uh, nearly efficient algorithms for the graph matching problem on correlated uh, random graphs. And this is based on joint work with my host at MIT, Boaz Barak, and as well as uh, some of his students, Xi Ning Chu, Ji Shen Lei, and Yuki Sheng. And now that I attempted to pronounce their names, that's the hardest part of my talk is over. So, <laughs> uh, all right. So this problem is called the graph matching problem, but perhaps it should have more appropriately been named uh, approximate graph isomorphism. Uh, in this graph, we get two graphs as input on n vertices each. And our goal is to find the permutation of the vertices of one graph onto the other graph is to maximize the number of shared edges. Uh, so that if I denote by a sub g0 the adjacency matrix of g0 and by a sub g1 the adjacency matrix of g1, the goal is to find the permutation of the rows and columns of this adjacency matrix that maximizes the inner product of the two adjacency matrices. So for example, for this permutation, the number of shared edges is 4. Okay, and for this other permutation, the number of shared edges is 5, and this is the maximum that I can achieve for these two graphs. So our goal is to find the permutation that maximizes this objective. Okay, so uh, for those of you who are familiar with uh, uh, NP-hardness proofs, it, it will take you maybe five minutes to come up with a proof of uh, NP-hardness for this problem. Um, there's a really easy reduction from the quadratic assignment problem for non-simple graphs as well as a variety of other reductions that you can construct for yourselves. There's also a hardness of approximation result for this problem, uh, although based on Feige's random three set hypothesis. So uh, this hypothesis, which is um, maybe less well accepted than the P versus NP hypothesis, uh, still shows the hardness for the approx approximation version of this problem. Um, okay. So but what is it, constant factor or any constant factor? So there exists some constant factor beyond which it's NP hard to approximate under this. Uh, and it's like one minus <coughs> Point oh one or something. Does it create nice random graphs, or are they still sort of messy based on their gadgets? They're they're uh, a little bit messy. I mean, it's not the distribution that you would come up with unless you were coming up with this reduction. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But when it's hard to approximate, it's hard like to uh, distinguish the case when there's alpha, uh, like an alpha correlation versus beta correlation. Yeah, yeah. Or totally isomorphic versus alpha, epsilon phi. Alpha versus beta, so 1 minus epsilon versus 1 minus some function of epsilon. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay, good question. Okay, so, so of course, um, the people who use this problem in practice are completely undeterred by these hardness results. Uh, and there are a number of applications in, in a variety of fields. So in computational biology, uh, your graphs might be two protein networks that you want to understand the interactions between. Um, there are creepy applications such as de-anonymization of social networks. You have anonymous social network data and uh, unanonymous social network data, and you want to discover the identities of the people. Um, there are less nefarious social networks uh, applications. Uh, for image alignment, you can have two images where you have the segmentation of each of the images as your networks or your graphs, and you want to map them onto each other. Uh, you know, a variety of applications in machine learning, and even in pattern recognition, we found this uh, uh, survey called 30 Years of Graph Matching in Pattern Recognition. Okay, so this problem has been around for a while and, it, and is used pretty widely in practice. And in 2011, in a KDD paper, Pedarsani and Grossglasser introduced the following average case model for this problem. Okay, so I have the following structured model. I take a graph sampled from the erdos uh distribution with parameter p. And now from it, I'm going to take two copies. And in each copy, I'm going to independently sum sample each edge with probability gamma. So every edge I throw away with probability 1 minus gamma, and I keep it with probability gamma. Okay. Now I have two graphs, and their average degree is p times gamma n, and they're correlated random graphs. And now I apply a random permutation to one of the graphs so that uh, it's difficult to know what the permutation is. Okay. So this is, this is called the correlated random graphs model, uh, but I'll be referring to it as the structured model from now on in the talk. So yeah. is there a good reason to focus specifically on an erasure channel rather than a symmetric one? Uh, you mean additions and addition? Uh, I guess I hadn't thought of the additions, but I think many times in applications, you think of having the true network, uh, G, and then you subsample, like, you know, you see, you observe some partial sample of it in one case and the partial sample of it in the other. So, like, in the case of social networks, you'd have the graph of actual, uh, you know, friendships or something. And then one social network, you see 
some subset of these edges and another you see the other yeah I think it's probably not even all that different because if I add in edges when I go from G to G0 or G to G1, um, I could have created some like graph that contains their union and that would still be like Erdos Rainy with a different parameter P. But it's, those are two independent processes, right? Uh -huh. So I'm. Um, oh, that's okay. Yeah. Yeah, I, th I think Anker is probably right, but maybe like we. Offline. Okay, so so uh, and okay, so so for this model, it's not difficult to compute what the optimal permutation should achieve, what the best objective value for the graph matching problem should be. Uh, so you just think of all of the edges in G that survived both subsampling into G1 and subsampling into G0. Uh, and in order for a single edge to survive, you that it, it exists in G with probability p and survives into both graphs with probability gamma squared. So the objective value should be something like p gamma squared and choose two. OK. So and uh, maybe it's useful to compare to the following null model. So in this null model, I sample two graphs independently from gn p gamma. OK, so I have two completely independent air training graphs with average degree p gamma matching the average degree in the structured model. Here, uh, it's not difficult to see that for a single permutation, the expected value of this objective function should be p squared gamma squared n choose two. Okay, and then as long as p is sufficiently large as a function of n, like log n over n, you can do a union bound and show that this will be the optimum objective value. So, uh, and you can see the objective value is off by a factor of p between these two models. And uh, even though this, this model was introduced as a sort of toy example for a de-anonymization task uh, in this paper, since then, many people in the uh, statistics and information theory communities have studied this problem because it's a very natural inference problem, the, the inference problem of recovering the optimal permutation pi. Um, OK, so. As an inference problem, the first question that you might ask is, what's the information theoretic limit for the parameters pi and gamma for which we can recover the optimal permutation uh, uniquely? And uh, the following theorem of Kalina and Kubayash says that as long as, sorry, as long as p gamma squared is at least log n over n, with high probability pi will be the unique maximizing permutation. So you can just search over all permutations and then uh, recover the best one. So just to be clear, this is like constant one. Yeah, constant one asymptotically. I think here there's like a plus. It might even be more extreme in that in the, here there's like a plus little o of uh, log n. Yeah. OK. Uh, yeah. Um, but now uh, you might ask, like, is there an algorithm also to recover the optimal permutation pi? Right? And even though this feels like an average case version of the graph isomorphism problem, I want to explain why average case uh, algorithms for graph isomorphism will fail. So one, one popular strain of algorithms for graph isomorphism in random graphs is matching local neighborhoods. So uh, if in our problem we had two copies of an identical graph, then the neighborhoods of individual vertices will be unique if I take a large enough neighborhood. Right? And based on that, I could just make the, the matching of the neighborhoods if I look at sufficiently large local neighborhoods. The problem is that in our case, we have this noise parameter gamma, right? We subsample every edge with probability gamma. And I want you to think of gamma as a small constant, something like 1 over 100, OK? So in this case, when we apply the noise, the neighborhoods end up looking nothing like each other. And so heuristics like this uh, will not work for this problem. OK. Uh, another class of algorithms are uh, spectral algorithms, in which you take the adjacency matrix for each of your copies of your graphs, and you look at the top eigenvector of the adjacency matrix. And because of uniqueness in the entries of the eigenvector, you can find the permutation between the vertices. In this case, again, remember that we're adding a very large amount of noise, right? Like a noise that's uh, proportional to 1 minus gamma fraction of the original matrix, right? And because of this, the, the top eigenvectors will also look like they have nothing to do with each other. Um, I mean, they'll be a little bit correlated, but their correlation is going to be something like a uh, polynomial in gamma. And so no longer will the entries be helpful in recovering the permutation. Yeah. That's a dumb question. If, if I was to replace the set of permutation matrix with, say, the set of orthogonal matrices, yeah. how, how much would the, this maximum change? Like, it feels like intuitively the maximum should still be a permutation. Yeah, so it's, it's, it's not. If, if, okay. if all you do is you replace it with a, with a uh, class of orthogonal matrices, it, it won't actually, the objective value will be uh, 
dramatically changed. Um, and I, I can uh, even prove it to you in like three minutes offline if, if you want. Uh, yeah. But yeah, that's a, that's a good question, right? Um, OK, so, so what are actual algorithms for this robust average case? So most of the algorithms start from a seed, right? So in, in this uh, model, it's a, it's a different model. You assume that there's some set of vertices s in G0 such that you know the permutation between s to its uh, uh, counterpart in G1. Okay, so think about this as, as having some uh, domain knowledge, right? Like maybe in a social network, you know some subset of the identities in the social network and how they map onto the other, uh, and, and this can help you uh, recover the permutation. And if you assume you have the seed information, there's some simple percolation uh, that succeeds. So the simple percolation is you just look at the neighborhood uh, of every vertex in G0 into S and the neighborhood of every vertex into G1 into pi of S, and if they look similar, you match the vertices, and then you can continue to iterate in this way. Um, if you have sufficiently large seed or enough domain knowledge, then this seeded algorithm will approximately recover pi. Okay. Uh, there's a more recent algorithm due to Mosel and Zhu, uh, which uses much more delicate neighborhood statistics in, in conjunction with the seed information. And Using this approach, they achieve the information theoretic limit in p and gamma. Uh, but they still require polynomially large seeds for most values of p. So uh, there's a kind of complicated uh, function of uh, p that determines how large the seed should be. But um, for most values of p, they still need a, a so polynomially large seed. Epsilon is a function of p, or? Um... Yeah, you should think as, OK, so epsilon is a function of how far uh, P is like the exponent of P and N is from being an integer. So okay, so it's some some uh, uh, function like that. Uh, but what if you don't have domain knowledge about the problem that you're considering? Well, then you, in order to apply these algorithms, you would need to guess the set S, the set pi of S, and the permutation between them, right? And this takes at least sub-exponential time in order to guess. Uh, the correct one. Okay, so uh, our result is the first unseated algorithm for this problem. Um, don't try to interpret this theorem statement too closely, but essentially what we say is that uh, as long as the average degree is in some range, and as long as our subsampling probability is at least a constant, then there's a quasi-polynomial time algorithm that will recover the permutation pi with high probability. Okay, and uh, what we require is that the average degree is in one of these two regimes, so between uh, n to some function that's uh, little of 1 and n to the 1 over 153. We didn't really make an effort to optimize this constant. Uh, and that between n to the 2 thirds and uh, any uh, sub uh, constant uh, function of n. So you need n to the, is it the, so I don't know about, the, uh, I'm, I'm trying to understand what, so 0 is a little of 1, right? So yeah. Uh, yeah, this needs to be at least n to the log log n over log n okay, so to it's the an one half. Little over yeah, it's an explicit little of one. Yeah, uh, and and I know this gap looks very strange, and I agree that it probably shouldn't be there. Um, but I'll explain a little bit later in the talk why this happens. Yeah. Um, so uh, perhaps you want to just defer this question until later. But how much of this is real? Like, is there an actual monitor on this thing? Do we expect the problem to become easier if the average degree is higher or not? Or is there actually some sort of... Uh, no, no, this, this is completely artificial. There, there is a monotonicity. It does become easier when uh, the average degree is, is higher. Um, yeah, this, I mean, I think we conjecture that our algorithm should work even in this regime, but we're just unable to, to analyze it. And, and you'll see very, uh, like very concretely why later in the talk. Okay, uh, we also actually allow gamma to be a little bit subconstant. So think it's like 1 over log log n. So this means that we're really dramatically throwing away a large portion of the edges in this subsampling step. Uh, oh, another thing is that we can also fill in a couple of uh, other uh, discrete points along this uh, average degree line. So this, this even shows to you like, uh, that this monotonicity can't exist. Okay. Uh, and if you think about the following alternative problem in which we're trying to do a hypothesis testing between the structure distribution and the null distribution, then for this hypothesis testing problem, uh, if p and gamma are essentially as they are above here, 
then we can give a polynomial time distinguishing algorithm uh, for, for these two distributions. Okay, so, so for this hypothesis testing version, I'll, I'll talk a little bit about it more later, but here we can actually do it uh, efficiently. All right, and let me just say a very short thing about our approach, and I'll, I'll go much more into depth in a moment. Um, but our approach is to consider small subgraphs. For the hypothesis testing problem, we look at the correlation of small subgraph counts in the two graphs. And uh, for the recovery task, we're performing a matching based on rare subgraphs uh, in the graph. And using this approach, we're able to get seedless algorithms. So this, this is the first uh, instance of seedless algorithms for the low degree uh, regime, like degree less than uh, constant times n. OK, so just a brief outline of the talk. So first I'll tell you about our algorithm for the distinguishing or hypothesis testing task, because it's a simpler algorithm, and it contains many of the ideas that we need for the recovery task. Then I'll tell you about recovery, and then I'll wrap up. OK. okay. So, okay, so here, what's the problem? So here I'm given two graphs. And with probability half, let's say they're sampled from this structure distribution. And with probability half, they're sampled from this null distribution. And I, based on one sample, want to say with high probability from which of the two distributions they are. OK, now suppose that I allow you exponential time. So then there's a very simple brute force algorithm, which is just I check every single permutation. I see what the objective value is for the graph matching problem on each. And by the arguments <coughs> that I made previously when I was introducing these two distributions, if the permutation has value at least pi gamma squared n squared for the graph matching problem, then I can be confident that they come from the structure distribution. Okay. But now what about efficient algorithms? So the first thing you might try is you might try counting triangles. Okay. So let me define the following function, which is just the product of the number of triangles in the first graph times the product of the number of triangles in the second graph. All right. So if I'm in the null distribution, the triangle counts in G0 and G1 are completely independent. right? And each one has about p gamma n cubed triangles, so their product should be something like p gamma n to the 6. I'm, I'm neglecti neglecting constant factors uh, here. Uh, OK. If I receive G0 and G1 from the structure distribution, then the triangle counts will be correlated. So, it's, so in particular, if I have a triangle that comes from G, Right, the probability that it survives into both G0 and G1 is, is going to be uh, gamma squared. So here the objective value is going to be something like P gamma n to the 6 for arbitrary triangles that have nothing to do with each other, plus for the n cubed triangles times uh, P that come from G, uh, I'm going to have a gamma squared probability that they survive into both. Okay, yeah. Yeah, I, uh, I neglected the constant factors here, but Trust me that they work out if you do the computation uh, carefully. I just didn't want to carry around a bunch of uh, binomial things and confuse everyone by forcing them to do arithmetic. Uh, yeah. Uh, also, on my slides there will be some uh, mathematical expressions, but I uh, urge you to not try to do the arithmetic unless you uh, really want to. Um, I'll try to explain as, as uh, we go along the sort of high level uh, where the action is happening. Okay. Uh, Great. So, so it seems like this triangle correlation is a, is a great estimator, right? I have an expectation that's larger in the structured case than in the null case, right? And, uh, and now I can just uh, like uh, wash my hands and uh, go home. Uh, but the problem is that we neglected to ask about the variance, right? So what's the variance of this estimator? So even if we're being as optimistic as we can be in the null case, the variance should be something like proportional to the square root of the expectation, right? Because we th think of this as a, as a bunch of independent uh, uh, random variables. And in this case, the variance is going to be p gamma n quantity cubed. And if you compare this to the difference between the structure and the null, the difference is smaller by a factor of gamma cubed, right? And so this means that the variance, uh, the standard deviation, is going to completely overwhelm this, uh, this boost that we see. So the estimator isn't as good as we think, maybe. OK, so this looks like a problem. I, I mean, uh, suppose that we didn't only see one copy of G0 and G1, but that we instead got t independent samples of pairs G0 and G1 from our distribution. right? Then we would know how to improve this estimator. 
what we do is we would just take the average correlation over all of our trials, right? Uh, then uh, the expectation would be unchanged in the structure distribution and in the null distribution, but the variance or the standard deviation would go down by a factor of one over square root the number of trials, right? And so then if we have sufficiently many trials, we can overcome this, uh, this uh, noise in the estimator. All right, but, but the model wasn't that we get T independent samples. Okay, so what are we gonna do instead? So what we're gonna do is we're going to, instead of looking at independent samples, we'll look for independent subgraphs in the graph. So suppose that we had T subgraphs, H1 through HT, such that their counts were uncorrelated in the graphs. Okay, then we would expect the same behavior, right? We would expect the expectation to be unchanged uh, and the variance to go down. Okay, so, so but this is a, uh, right now a very uh, abstract concept, like what does it mean for graphs to be independent in, uh, in my graphs, right? Uh, and, and when I started this project, I, I didn't realize some uh, pretty uh, delicate things about the concentration of subgraph counts in GNP. So this is all um, as old as the literature on random graphs, but let me just uh, say it because I think it, it's surprising the first time you see it. Suppose I have a, a graph sampled from GNP, and let's say that P is like n to the negative 6 over 8, okay? And let's say that I want to look at the concentration of this subgraph count, all right? So what's the expectation of the number of copies of H that appear in G? So the expectation is basically going to be something like N choose six, because six is the number of vertices in H, <coughs> times P to the eighth, because eight is the number of edges in H, and then something about the labelings out here, right? This is going to be a constant factor term, so it's not gonna matter. And asymptotically, this is going to be order one. Right? So we expect to see a constant number of copies of H in our graph. On the other hand, let's look at this subgraph of H. Right? H has K4 as a subgraph. How many labeled copies of K4 do we expect to see in the graph? So this is going to be something like N choose 4 P to the 6. Uh, and if you simplify that, that's like 1 over root N. Okay? So the number of K4s that we'll see in our graph will, with good probability, be fewer than 1. And so this means that the number of copies of H in the graph cannot concentrate around its mean, right? Okay, so, so for me, the first time that I saw this, it was, it was very surprising, but uh, it's, in, it's in all of the, you know, like a classical random graphs uh, textbooks. Um, and this lemma, which is, again, classical, but it's also a very straightforward calculation, basically says that if I have a constant size subgraph, its variance will be governed by the subgraph that appears the least number of times in the graph. Okay, so that's and then even at like a, an intuitive statement if you don't try to look too hard at uh, this expression here. And it's the density. Right? It's the density, right. I mean, uh, the thing that, that governs this expectation is the density. the density, yeah. Uh, and let me also convince you that it's not only about the variance of individual graphs, but it's also about the covariance of graphs, right? So this, this is relevant to our notion of independence. So say that I have two graphs, H and H prime, and they both have the same dense subgraph as a common subgraph. So now their covariance will be uh, affected by the presence of this graph. Typically, we don't expect to see any copies of, uh, uh, we, we typically don't, don't expect that the copies of H and H prime should be related to each other at all, except that the moment that a K4 appears, we'll see many, many copies of H and many, many copies of H prime as well. Sorry, if you look at triangles, <coughs> why, which is the densest subgraph of itself, yeah. why do we worry about more complicated graphs which have a densest subgraph? So, right, so, so triangles, triangles don't have this, uh, this issue. This is just for, say that I, uh, the problem is that I want to have a large set of subgraphs. So I wanted T trials, but here T is going to be the number of subgraphs. So you want the concentration over all the graphs that you see there, not just yeah, triangles. Yeah, not just triangles, exactly. Uh, okay. Okay, that's a great question. I think also it will be answered more thoroughly as we uh, continue. Okay, so, so exactly. So the, the notion that matters here is strict balance. So we say that a graph H is strictly balanced if all of its strict subgraphs have strictly smaller edge density. So examples of graphs that are strictly balanced are cycles uh, and trees. Okay, 
And examples of subgraphs that are not strictly balanced include uh, this, our favorite graph H that we saw before, uh, as well as cycles with a hair hanging off of them. Here, the cycle is denser than the entire graph. Um, and even if you have two copies of the same graph that aren't connected to each other, here, uh, the subgraph that's just the restriction to one of them will be uh, as dense as the entire thing. Okay. All right. So if you have a graph that is strictly balanced, and if the parameters are set so that its number of appearances is constant, then uh, any subgraph will appear with super constant expectation. Okay. And what that means, plugging back into the lemma that we saw before, is that the variance is going to be little o of the expectation. And so we'll get the concentration that we want using Chebyshev or something like that. So if I manage to find t graphs, which are all non-isomorphic, strictly balanced graphs, and I set the parameters so that each appears a constant fraction of the time, or sorry, with constant expectation, then I'll have the consequence that their counts will concentrate around their means, and also their counts will be asymptotically independent. Right? So I, I get these uh, uh, independent subgraphs. Okay, so now my distinguishing algorithm is just going to be like this. I'm going to come up with some test set of graphs. They're going to be strictly balanced, and here I have some parameters which I'll set in a, in a moment um, that will all be uh, chosen uh, properly. So, so I'm going to set the parameters so that the expected number of appearances is order one, so that all of the nice, uh, uh, you know, random graph theory applies easily. Uh, and then what I'm going to do is I'm going to compute the average correlation of the counts of the different graphs inside the G0 and G1. Okay, so for each of the H1 through HT, I'll compute the number in G0, the number in G1, I take the product and I compute this average correlation. Okay, in the structured case uh, versus the null case, the difference in the expectation is going to be like N to the V, uh, where V is the number of vertices in a test graph, gamma squared P to the E, where E is the number of edges in a test graph. And in the null case, the variance is going to be like 1 over square root t times uh, the square root of the expectation. So as long as I can take t to be sufficiently large, this will be smaller than in the structured case. Okay? Uh, and there are only something like v to the e graphs with v vertices and e edges, and I need to take uh, v to be this large so that I can cancel the um, the uh, variance enough. So th this is how these parameters are set. Don't, I mean, uh, don't pay too much attention uh, unless you, you really want to. And now my algorithm will just be to compute this correlation. And uh, if it's at least large enough, then I say I'm in the structured case. And otherwise, I'll say I'm in the null case. right? So, so that's it for the distinguishing task. OK. Uh, the independent graphs, though? Yes, exactly. So this is all depending on finding such a test set. Right, which I haven't said anything about how to do. Okay, uh, another thing is that I didn't say anything about the variance in the structured case, which is also uh, annoying but not very, uh, uh, you know, insightful uh, calculation to take care of. So it's not different. Sorry. It's not very different. It's not very different, but it's different enough that it's a little bit annoying. Yeah, it's not. It's not different. Okay. Yeah. Okay. All right, so, so this was my outline before, but now I'm going to sneak in another uh, bullet point, which is to talk about these test graphs, like Ankur was saying. So where am I going to find such, uh, such a large set of strictly balanced graphs that are non-isomorphic and uh, act independently? Okay, so, so remember that we fixed the number of vertices uh, and the number of edges, and uh, we required that the expected number of appearances of a graph is going to be like a constant, right? And that's where this weird behavior comes from. So uh, for each choice of P and N, essentially, and uh, choice of uh, V governed by this uh, noise uh, subsampling probability, that, that's, we just needed that so that we would be able to cancel the variance, we'll get a point along this uh, line. And then for the point along this line, we'll have to demonstrate that there exist sufficiently many uh, test graphs. Okay. So, but now I want you to only think about a subgraph on V vertices with E edges and see for, for which choices of V and E can we construct enough test graphs. Okay. Sorry, so you don't have any, uh, th there's nothing to be gained by just uh, having uh, 
sub uh, test set with different number of vertices and different number of edges? It, yeah, it seems like yeah. There's nothing to be really gained from uh, from this. Uh, then you need to make sure they're not peering in each other. Uh, th that's also an issue. The, the other thing is that um, the so say that I fix. I mean, I'm going to always have a fixed edge density, right? So I'm always going to have some fixed ratio between v and e, right? And now the largest choice of v and e will dominate like the the number. So 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 somehow if I threw away all of the smaller ones, it wouldn't really matter. Yeah. Okay, so, so uh, my first claim is that if I wanted H to be deregular, right, then it's very easy to find strictly balanced graphs. The reason is because any connected deregular graph is strictly balanced. Uh, it's easy to see because in any strict subgraph, the average degree has to be less than D, right? Okay, so easy enough. We filled in every point along this line that corresponds to this H being deregular. All right, but now we, we want to uh, hit significantly more points. So what are we going to do? What if we want the degree to be between d and d plus 1? Right? So here what we do is we just start with a deregular random graph on v vertices. And we add to it a random matching on some fraction of the vertices. Okay? And now we just have to prove that the, th the thing that we end up with is still strictly balanced. And the way that we do this is we just use the expansion of the underlying uh, deregular graph, right? So if I pick a random deregular graph, it will be a very good expander. And then even if all of these edges ended up in a small uh, portion of this graph, you'd worry that it might be too dense. But because of the expansion of the underlying graph, it ends up being OK. So that's how we fill in this upper interval. By varying lambda? By varying d and lambda. <laughs> and so does the lower bound on that <laughs> interval just come from the fact that like you need it to be three regular random graphs or something? Uh, or, uh, so so that would yeah so three regular probably work. We actually started uh, six regular, uh -huh. uh, and that gives us uh, n to the two thirds. Three regular, I guess, would give you uh, n to the one third probably. I I uh, don't want to do the the sure. calculation in my head, um, but uh, but we sort of didn't uh, focus on pushing it down to the other interval, and in a moment you'll you'll see why. Okay. Okay, so, so suppose that d is less than 3, right? Then if I take a random two regular graph, it definitely will not expand. It'll be just an a arbitrary collection of edges. And uh, even if I start with a cycle, right? The cycle is the uh, two connected uh, uh, regular graph on v vertices. Uh, and that won't work very well either. So what we do instead is we start with a three regular graph on some fraction of the vertices. And we take each path and we subdivide it into uh, paths of appropriate length. So uh, paths of length k and k plus 1, where the number of paths of length k and the number of paths of length k plus 1 are chosen appropriately. And this will get us a graph with average degree between 2 and 3. Okay, And we can get any average degree that we want uh, in this way. Now we still have to prove that the graph is strictly balanced. And here it becomes uh, significantly more tricky to do this. Um, we still use the expansion of the underlying three regular graphs, but it's easier to prove that you get a strictly balanced graph if you add long paths. The reason is because if I'm only subdividing some of the edges into paths of length 2, you could worry that there's some region of the graph where I didn't subdivide any edges into paths of length 2, and then that region of the graph will become too dense. Okay, so, uh, so this is why we're only able to get um, long paths in our proof here, and that's why we fill in this interval up to n to the some constant that's uh, pretty small. OK, and then, and then this regime uh, we, we have yet to fill in. Um, so, so yeah, so that's, that's it. But uh, I would conjecture that actually the construction that we described should fill in this whole interval uh, if we uh, analyze them in a significantly uh, more you know, uh, <laughs> uh, precise way. Um, and uh, in any case, uh, it would be very remarkable if there didn't, e even if it wasn't our construction, but some other test set, it would be very remarkable to me if in some regions in this interval you have many strictly balanced graphs, and in other regions you just uh, don't. Okay, so, so that's it. So if you can show that there exists test set at every uh, density, then uh, you'd be done and you'd get uh, all the way in this whole interval. So even the question of like, there's a particular like functional on 
like E and V, where then you want a range over all strictly balanced graphs, mm -hmm. and essentially you want to figure out whether it covers the interval. Yeah. Right? I see. So that's not known. Right, right. And, and, and the, the challenging thing, so in each of these, uh, uh, in this whole interval, it should be easy to find one or maybe like 10 strictly balanced graphs. But we need uh, V to the order E strictly balanced graphs in order to have the distinguisher work. So, so really what's, what's troubling is, um, is finding sufficiently many. Uh, So, so that's, uh, so that's uh, that. For recovery, we need as well a quantitative notion of strictly balanced. So we need something about small sets have to have uh, be even sparser than uh, big sets. Uh, and that complicates this construction a little bit uh, as well. OK, so now let me say a little bit about how we do the recovery algorithm. It will, yeah, yeah. So you use Chebyshev for the concentration of the number of subgraphs. Sub yes. Uh, if you had a tighter, in a, a tighter concentration, like uh, Janssen's inequality gives a tighter, exp nearly exponential concentration, that doesn't buy you anything uh, stronger? Uh, that may buy us something stronger for the distinguishing case. Um, but and, 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 and for the distinguishing case, if we really cared about uh, uh, optimizing that, I think there would be a number of ways in which we could do that, including right. what you mentioned. Right. Uh, but, but for recovery, uh, we can't. And in a moment, you'll also see why for that. So, but um, for distinguishing, but it would not change the intervals that you have for the edge probability. It would not improve uh, these two distinguishing. You have two intervals where it works. I, yeah, so, so I think what would happen is that we wouldn't need to demonstrate quite so many uh, s subgraphs. Uh, and then it would possibly improve this interval. And there are other ways maybe we could improve the interval too, like by allowing uh, to look at subgraphs that appear with not with constant expected number of appearances, but larger expected number of appearances. Um, but for the recovery, we, we really uh, don't do this. And so, s because that's, that was the focus of the work, uh, um, we didn't uh, bother optimizing the distinguishing. I c yeah, I'll, I'll explain the recovery in a second. Hopefully, it will uh, become clear why. OK, so. Let me first argue why distinguishing doesn't equal recovery in this case. So in the distinguishing task, we were counting subgraphs. But this doesn't t really tell us very much about the matching. Like even if I know that there's a vertex that appears in a triangle in one graph and a vertex that appears in a triangle in the other graph, uh, it won't tell me how to conclude that they're mapped to each other. right? And the other thing is that we set the density for our subgraph so that each appears in a uh, a constant number of times, and each is on a polynomial number of vertices in, in gamma. And we think of gamma as being a constant. And so what this means is that only a constant number of vertices in the entire graph will participate even in subgraphs from our test set. So most of the graphs don't get covered at all, and we can't re reconstruct a large portion of the permutation. All right, so what's, what's our strategy? So our strategy is a completely different, uh, uh, is to work in a completely different parameter regime. Uh, Boaz coined this to be the black swan approach, so he's a very uh, creative guy. Um, and our goal is going to be to, to identify rare subgraphs that appear in both graphs and match the vertices between them. So we'll choose a test set like before, but we'll set the parameters so that if you look at the expected number of graphs, that appeared in the base graph and survived the subsampling into both of the graphs, this will be much larger than the number of unrelated pairs that appeared in the original graph and then survived into both subgraphs. Okay? So that means that if we see uh, one of our test subgraphs in both G0 and G1, it's more likely because those graphs should be mapped to each other, those vertices should be mapped to each other, than because of uh, just arbitrary copies of the base graph appearing in G. Okay, and if you, if you simplify the expression, and also if you think about it uh, uh, reasonably, what this means is basically every subgraph should appear with expectation less than one in the original base graph G, right? So, so we want many fewer than one to be the expected appearances for each of our subgraphs. Uh, and then what we'll do is we'll choose a large test set with many vertices so that most of the graph gets covered uh, in expectation anyway. Um, so great. So, so then my claim, uh, and this is like a very cartoon of the claim because it's, it's a little bit more complicated, is that when we choose our parameters properly, there will be at most one copy of each of the swans in the graph with high probability. And also that at least a constant fraction of the vertices participate in such a swan. Uh, and then we can use some, uh, some this will be like our seed, and then we can use percolation to complete the permutation to the rest of the graph. 
Uh, and our, our proofs are all using the second moment method and, uh, and Chebyshev's inequality. And one reason why we couldn't apply uh, known results from the random graph literature to this is because we're working in the regime where the expected number of appearances is much less than one. And if you're studying random graphs and subgraph counts, usually you're not very interested in, in uh, subgraphs that appear fewer than once <laughs> uh, by, by polynomial factors. And so this is, a, this is sort of a challenging regime to work in, and it, it required us to uh, sort of beef up the requirements on the test subgraphs that we consider um, and, and stuff like that. Uh, but, uh, but essentially, these are, these are the claims, and we just prove them with, with you know, second moment method. Oh, I, I guess uh, many times I forget to say why these are called black swans, so maybe I'll just do that now. I think they're called black swans because they're really rare. Like, you know, it's like a black swan where, like, typically swans are white. Okay, so that's, a, that's the black swan approach. All right, so, so, uh, so now let me conclude with a little bit of uh, context for why we're studying this problem. Okay, so usually I like to think about uh, statistical inference problems, and I also like to think about convex optimization. And in particular, I like to think about information computation trade-offs and how that fits in with uh, convex optimization, and, and a tool I like to use to study that is the sum of squares hierarchy. So, so we are usually uh, right here. Okay, so uh, in convex optimization, Many times we have some non-convex problem, and a big tool that we have for handling that is semi-definite programming relaxations. Okay, so this is just some family of convex programs. And the sum of squares hierarchy is a sequence of semi-definite programming relaxations in which I can take my basic relaxation and add variables and constraints to it automatically to get a more and more powerful relaxation. So if I start with a program over n by n matrices, at the second level of the hierarchy I have n squared by n squared matrices, at the third level n cubed by n cubed, etc until I have exponentially sized SDPs, which are guaranteed to give me accurate results. Okay, and and uh, usually people refer to the rungs on this ladder as the degree of the relaxation, uh, because they correspond to optimizing over polynomials of a certain degree. Okay, so, so it's not uh, important to know uh, too much about what's going on here, just to understand sort of the, the uh, context and what this tool is gonna do for us. And one question that I'm, I'm interested in is, can we understand trade-offs between information and computation? So uh, to explain this, I'll just use an example. So say that I have a instance of random KSAT in which there's a planted solution. So I sample a KSAT formula such that there, I'm guaranteed to have at least one satisfying assignment. Okay, so the uh, parameter that I vary is the clause density, the number of clauses. So say that I have alpha and clauses. As I reveal more and more clauses, it's like I'm revealing more information about the planted solution. There's some threshold at approximately 2 to the k log k at which I'm guaranteed to have a unique solution. Okay, but the threshold at which we can find polynomial time algorithms is way far out when alpha is uh, a function of n, right? So n to the k over 2 minus 1. Okay, and uh, what I want to understand is how much computation do I need in order to hit alpha in the middle? So this is for polynomial time, but if I'm allowed to take sub-exponential time, can I do alpha in between? And how can I expect that the best algorithms will perform in this regime? Right? And uh, using the sum of squares hierarchy can help us study these questions. So, uh, for example, uh, in a paper with uh, my advisors, uh, this should be uh, Satish instead, but uh, in a paper with my advisors, uh, we uh, characterize the degree of the sum of squares hierarchy that you need in order to uh, solve this planted case at instance. So uh, at the bottom levels of the hierarchy, you can do polynomial time algorithms, and then you can smoothly trade off until you get to the unique uh, solution threshold in uh, exponential time. So How do you define the planted case at? So I, I guess uh, you, it, maybe there's a couple, number of ways to define it, and it, it will all be uh, equivalent, but one way to define it is you sample a uh, solution, like a Boolean assignment, and then you sample a case at instance with alpha and clauses conditioned on uh, satisfying this, ha having this as a satisfying assignment. Yeah. Okay, so, so what does this have to do with these uh, subgraph counts and uh, statistics? So one thing that uh, we have a chance of understanding at very fine granularity is the exact information computation guarantees of sum of squares. So there's uh, emerging intuition and a set of conjectures 
and that sum of squares uh, at degree d should be approximately as powerful as looking at subgraph counts of size roughly d. Okay, uh, so the sum of squares SCP should be at most as powerful as low degree statistics for average case problems. And it's known to hold for several uh, instances, for example, planted clique, uh, planted sat, and other constraint satisfaction problems, uh, spike tensor models, okay? Uh, and uh, actual uh, proof along these lines is that sum of squares is at most as powerful as a family of what we call low degree spectral algorithms. And, and uh, I don't wanna give the formal definition now, but um, I'm happy to discuss it offline. So, so we show that sum of squares for average case problems is captured by this seemingly weaker family of algorithms, spectral algorithms. Okay, uh, but uh, one question is, do convex relaxations know about these black swans, right? Uh, or in other words, does the natural sum of squares relaxation recover the optimal permutation in this case? So say that we took the sum of squares relaxation for the uh, optimization problem in terms of the permutation, Will it know about the swans and be able to recover the optimal permutation, or will it be distracted by all of the uh, uh, irrelevant subgraphs that it sees? Uh, and we, we don't know the answer to this question, okay? And we actually, in other contexts, also don't know the answer to this question. So, for example, if you look at community detection problems and the non-backtracking random walk matrix, it's not known whether sum of squares at low degrees can capture the uh, non-backtracking uh, arguments or, or match the performance of the non-backtracking random walk for recovery. So this is asking sort of about the reverse containment. Uh, it seems like sum of squares is captured by low degree polynomials, even though we don't have a proof of this fact. But now the question is, does sum of squares even capture all of the de low degree polynomials? And when we started this project, we were confident that we would be able to understand the low degree polynomials first and then understand sum of squares. And now it turns out that actually we don't know how to analyze the sum of squares relaxation for this problem. Okay, so, so the questions uh, left open are, is there recovery in polynomial time for this problem? We give uh, uh, quasi-polynomial algorithms. Can it be improved um, using sum of squares or uh, other variations on this theme? Uh, the fact that there are distinguishing algorithms in polynomial time kind of makes it seem as though there should also be recovery algorithms in polynomial time, but uh, it's not clear how to make it uh, work yet. Another question is, can we achieve the information theoretic threshold uh, i.e. Uh, get an algorithm for all p gamma squared n larger than log n. And so one, one direction is filling in this interval, which is maybe the less interesting thing. I think the more interesting thing is how should efficiency scale with this parameter gamma, the subsampling probability. So as you take gamma really small, like uh, one over poly, are there still efficient algorithms? My guess would be that there's actually a similar uh, computation information gap that you can observe there and matching it with algorithms is a nice open question. And then finally, uh, I want to ask if there can be practical heuristics that can be inspired by this work. So this work is somewhat tailored to the average graphs uh, setting, um, but can there be local heuristics based on identifying dense uh, subgraphs that will work as well in practice? Okay, so thanks so much for the attention and question. Any questions? So information theoretic threshold for hypothesis testing is the same? Uh, I think for hypothesis testing, it should be shifted. It definitely shouldn't be the sharp uh, one times log n, okay. uh, but I don't know about the, the... So you also don't know if your algorithm goes all the way down in the hypothesis testing case? Yeah, we don't know if the algorithm... Actually, in the hypothesis testing case, we uh, there were some asterisks in the theorem statement that I uh, didn't really draw attention to, but it should... I mean, if you want to take P to be log n over n, or, or like even n to the little of one over n, it doesn't run in polynomial time anymore because you need to take larger subgraphs. Yeah. So. Yeah. Other questions? So I have a question actually. Like, uh, what's your conjecture? Uh, okay. So if you come back one slide when you say recovery in polynomial time, so what do you believe is it is it possible or not? And if not, do you, can you think of at least a primitive like you know say, FIGA or something like this that will actually be amenable to reduction to this problem? I think it should be, okay, I think it should be possible that whenever, let's say, p is at least log n over n, so the original graph is connected, and let's say that gamma is at least a constant, uh, you can recover in polynomial time. Okay. I think that should be true. Okay. Thank you.
But why the reduction would probably suggest uh, would su or suggest that n to the log n is unlikely to no exist. If 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 the Feiger reduction worked, they would probably suggest that n to the log n uh, algorithm should not exist. I guess if you had a, a reduction that blew up the instance enough, just the right amount, then n over log n could be the correct. Uh, uh, thing and, and in some in some actual like in Nash equilibria that you do see hardness reductions for actual NP hardness that, that work this way but uh, I agree that it seems uh, trivially n to the log n algorithm does exist yeah where, where it doesn't rule out an n to the log n algorithm yes. but uh, oh, click for, for like approximate Nash yeah. and like two player games yeah click is also n to the log n there is a yeah yeah sorry question so if I, if I didn't want to recover permutation exactly, but uh -huh. I wanted to, let's say, recover 1 minus epsilon positions, yeah. is information theoretic threshold known? Uh, I'm not sure if it's known, but I think it should be. I mean, the the um, lower bound very much uses the fact that the graph becomes that the base graph becomes disconnected, uh, yeah. right? So, so uh, probably it should be the case that you can push the threshold down if you only care about recovering yeah, a constant sorry. fraction. Okay. Yeah. But uh, you don't remember from probably just. I don't. I, I'm not even aware of a result in the literature that says this, but that's not to say that it doesn't. Uh, right. It doesn't exist. Yeah. <coughs> okay. Well, that's it. Uh, let's thank. Thanks, again. guys.